Welcome to the Fuqua Faculty Conversations. Today we're speaking with Professor Cam Harvey about his upcoming webinar. So Professor Harvey, you've argued that this is an important time for risk management. Doesn't it seem like the market disagrees with you? Volatility is pretty low right now. It is low, um, and it's a bit puzzling why it's so low. And there's a number of possible reasons for this. Um, one reason is that the market is basically not understanding what's going on, so there's mispricing of, uh, of volatility. And um, it's also possible that people are just not thinking behaviorally, that the tail is something that they should focus on um, right now because they're looking to the upside. Um, and, and I think that this is also linked um, to this idea that that people often don't consider uh, the full management of risk. And what I mean by that is to manage the skew risk. Um, and this is a period where there is potentially a lot of negative skew risk. Uh, the macro economy, there is risk there. There's no doubt about it. Um, but people just not tuned in to that type of management. Is it the case that if volatility is decreasing, that people are reducing the amount of insurance they need to protect their portfolio? Okay, well, um, I think that could be true. And indeed, some people are not insuring their portfolio whatsoever, so, which, is, which is dangerous, uh, in, my, in my opinion. I think that part of this is that we're just so ingrained upon this idea of uh, risk being volatility. And you go, uh, and get your MBA and you're taught that you need to maximize expected return for some level of volatility. But the volatility is not the whole risk here. So you need to take into account the other stuff, which is the skew. And this is exactly what we're talking about. And very few, unfortunately, have explicit programs to manage the left tail. So these bad outcomes that uh, potentially you know, it could be disastrous for, for your portfolio. And, and basically, they just, you know, what's the volatility or what's the sharp ratio or, or something like that. Yet, we know that there is a chance of something really negative happening. So it, it's a paradox uh, to me. Um, people understand that there is a probability of a bad outcome. We just had a really bad outcome with the financial crisis. So that's fresh in the memory. People understand that there is a possibility of this happening again, yet people don't have a system in place to manage that tail risk. It's very dangerous, and that's why I think it's really important to have a, a different uh, perspective on risk and to explicitly manage this. So how do you manage ski risk? Well. Um, there's a number of ways uh, to do it. The first thing, you need a framework. You need to know what your skew is. And, and even that is, is somewhat difficult because if you just look to the past behavior of asset prices, um, you might not see it. So there might not be in the sample that you look at uh, this really bad realization, even though you know that there is a possibility of it happening again. So, so what are the things that you could do? Um, the simplest thing is to hold more cash. And often retail investors, that's what they do. They simply sell some of the risky assets, risk off, basically, go into cash. Um, I was recently uh, interviewing somebody, uh, kind of the opposite situation, and, and made this point about cash. And, and they said, well, you know, why should I put my portfolio in cash? Because I can barely get 1% return. And I said, well, you know, 1% looks pretty good when the risk asset is down 30%. Okay. So it really depends. So cash is an effective way uh, to reduce both the volatility of your portfolio and the skew, but it is costly. There's no doubt that it's costly because effectively, if you lock in, if you're lucky to lock in 1%, you've locked in a negative rate of return. Okay, so that's number one, cash. Um, number two would be to have a derivatives program. So simple way, uh, classic uh, portfolio insurance, you buy some puts. 
and uh, you don't have to buy at the money puts, you buy puts to the level of protection you want. So if you're willing to bear a negative 20% event, then you start buying puts that are 20% out of the money. Um, the problem with that strategy is that you need to continually roll over those puts and uh, it's costly because that premium of volatility starts increasing could be very substantial that you're, you're paying. So it is basically like any insurance, you have to pay a premium and that premium could get very steep. The third way to do it is to basically buy um, volatility. So there's many ways to do that today and uh, volatility ETFs are available um, like on the VIX, so let's say the VXX. Um, and one issue with doing that, and that's available to, for anybody, well actually almost anybody, because uh, it is pretty volatile, obviously by definition if you're buying volatility. Um, the problem with that is that again it's very costly. So if you look at VXX, that's the ETF, um, the return this year, okay, it's just over the last three months, is minus 50%. And for the last couple of years, you see similar returns, minus 50%, minus 50%. So again, very costly to do this insurance. And people say, ah, you know, they, it is so e expensive to buy volatility. And the idea is, when you're long volatility, if the market goes down very substantially, you expect the volatility go, to go up. So if you're long volatility, you're gonna have protection. So there's other things you could do, um, like going into the credit market, uh, and, and again, if, um, if the uh, volatility goes up, the credit spreads a blowout, and you could profit upon that. There are a number of companies that offer um, tail protect type of products. So these are specific investment strategies that invest in the type of assets that, um, that tend to do better. Um, in a meltdown situation like you know things like tips things like gold or commodities in, in general or uh, systematic strategies that um, try to um, kind of smartly capture the, the long volatility strategy without um, blowing your brains out by buying something like VXX or, or um, continually uh, rolling over options. What about managed futures as a possibility? That's a great point, um, and I should have included managed futures in the list of, of possibilities. They um, fall into uh, a very interesting category within kind of hedge fund strategies um, because they are the type of strategies that are, are momentum oriented, and these types of strategies tend to have positive skew. So if you look at, for example, an equity strategy, that strategy has got negative skew. And people don't like negative skew. Right? You, you pay to avoid it. Um, so if you look at managed futures, they actually have um, a pretty substantial positive skew, which means that on average, when equities are going down or there's a problem in, in the market, they tend to do well. So they've got very interesting uh, hedging properties. And on top of that, it's, it's always remarkable to me that they've got uh, historically uh, positive um, excess returns. So if you think about what they're doing, they're providing an insurance function. They're very uncorrelated with the other assets in your portfolio. And to get that type of insurance, you usually pay for it. Remember, if we, if we had an option buying strategy, you've got to pay for it. Uh, if you're buying volatility, you've got to pay for it. But this is like an investment class that tends to do well to provide that insurance function, yet um, there isn't the same cost um, you know, in, involved with it. And on top of that, and this is very important, um, most hedge fund strategies are not available to the retail investor because you have to be a qualified investor. But uh, for managed futures, this is a totally different story. It's the one piece of the hedge fund market where you can go in and, and buy um, at pretty moderate size. Add this to your portfolio, and effectively what you're doing, it's not a, a total guarantee, um, but 
what it does is reduce the left tail of your portfolio. And that, to me, is um, the first step uh, towards uh, risk management. What about a sector like emerging market debt? It's a, it's a great, uh, great question. Indeed, a lot of my um, early research was on emerging market debt. It was at a point where this was an exotic class uh, of debt where nobody wanted to touch it because you look at the history of emerging market debt, the history of default. So just a huge premium um, because of uh, the default risk. Various different crises that we went through with Latin America, um, many countries defaulting multiple times, multiple episodes. So the yields were higher and, um, and it wasn't obvious that that's where you wanted to invest because there was a lot of default risk. But today, it seems totally different, doesn't it? Because people are looking to emerging market debt as just in a regular portfolio. When you've got a fixed income portion, the question is, well, how much of that should go into emerging market debt? And uh, again, you know, for a, a retail investor, um, that was something that they wouldn't even consider uh, 10 years ago. So, so what are the reasons here? So why is there so much buzz about emerging market debt? And I think that there's a number of reasons. Number one, um, there is a natural tendency to reach for yield. Because right now, it is so difficult to get a rate of return. So cash is a negative real rate of return. A 10-year T-bond, a uh, treasury bond, um, the 2.3% yield. So it, it's barely at the inflation rate. So there's no real rate of return. So people start looking for investments that at least have uh, an expected rate of return that is higher than inflation. So what do you do? You look at higher risk um, credit uh, within the US or developed countries, or you go to emerging market debt. Now, you know, if you really think about it, um, emerging market debt, the yields traditionally were really high because of sovereign risk. But where is the sovereign risk right now? It, it shifted. So if you look at various indicators, and I'll just grab a couple, um, leverage. So go to the developed countries and look at their, their debt to GDP. And it's high, we know that. Um, it's high in the US, it's high in Europe, it's high in Japan. But if you go to the emerging markets, it's kind of the reverse of the situation that we had 10, 15 years ago. So their balance sheets are in much better shape than the developed countries. And then um, look at growth. Well, developed countries, um, basically you've got the US, which is kind of expected to have decent growth at trend um, in 2012. And if you go outside of the US, Europe is in recession. Japan is in a very low growth situation. Then you go to emerging markets and you see that the growth is spectacular. People talk about China. Um, well, you know, I expect China to have maybe 7.3% uh, growth in 2012, and that's, you know, disappointing for them. But there are seven or eight emerging markets that will outperform China. There's a lot of room uh, there. So you've got growth. You've got lower leverage, and I'm not saying that these markets are riskless or even less risky than investing in the US. That's definitely not the case. But if you've got a diversified portfolio of emerging market debt, um, that could be very attractive for your portfolio. Anyways, you have to look at your whole portfolio, and I'm actually kind of hesitant um, to, to to pile into U.S. debt right now, at even at 2.3 percent, or we've been even below 2 percent for the 10-year, um, there's not a lot of room for the yield to go down. And if the yield goes up, then you take a hit on the the value of your bonds. And as for equities, um, risk is just you know screaming at you, uh, even though it's not priced in the market right now. So um, to go and have some 
um, reasonably substantial portion of your uh, fixed income, let's say if you have a 40% allocation in fixed income, to have 25% of that or 10% of your overall portfolio in emerging market debt is not unreasonable. Um, I think that it, it makes sense. Um, it does have a higher uh, expected rate of return for good reason. Talk more about long-term inflation risk. Mm. Well, it is a very substantial risk right now. Um, in the webinar, we're going to go through basically all of the major risks that we face today and how to manage them. So um, what we've seen is an explosion of balance sheets. So the Fed was the first one to um, hugely increase their balance sheet. Um, the ECB has recently, with their LTROs, um, a third of Eurozone GDP is basically uh, represented by the balance sheet of the ECB. And the Bank of England has been the most aggressive. So it's more than 40% of the GDP uh, of the UK. So any time you've got a situation, and, and actually, let me just backtrack a little bit here. Um, with the emerging market, developed market comparison, very interesting, because if you do the world, and the central bank assets are about 8%, of world GDP. Okay, so you can see how great um, the proportion is that uh, the developed markets have gone way beyond the average and being very aggressive in terms of uh, essentially printing money. So um, it's kind of interesting, again, just like volatility seems kind of low given the risks that we face, why is it that the bond yields are so low because if you think there's a possibility of that balance sheet being fully monetized, and to be clear here, you can always take back some of the money that you printed. The problem is that politically it's going to be very difficult to take it back in the face of high unemployment. So there's going to be a lot of pressure not to take it back, not to put the interest rates up, not to take actions that uh, would seemingly slow the economy when the unemployment is very high. So that means, and we all know that unemployment lags uh, recovery, that means that uh, it's likely that the banks will not take, the central banks will not take back in time, which will cause some inflation. Uh, as velocity picks up, it has to. It's like an identity. Um, right now, we've had a lot of creation of money, but velocity has plummeted, and that means that we haven't seen the inflation. But as the economy picks up, unless you pull back some of that money, then there's going to be inflation. So, so that means that, um, that effectively, you know, for uh, either the institutional investor or the retail investor, you need to manage that risk. So if you've got a huge position in, let's say, fixed income in your portfolio, that could get hammered with an unexpected inflation pop. So what um, investors, especially institutional investors, have been doing very proactively, uh, especially within the last year, is to increase their allocation to real assets. You know, the, for example, commodities. So commodities are a very interesting sector in that they're um, one of the better things to invest in uh, because they provide a, a fairly good hedge against unexpected inflation. So I think that this is uh, a very substantial risk. Again, it's a risk that doesn't fully um, appear to be priced in the market, but that's no reason to ignore it. It needs to be managed. Treasuries could be impacted by growth in the U.S. too. Yes, that's a point I should have mentioned. Um, so there's, there's two reasons to beware uh, of treasuries. One is that the Fed uh, doesn't have the guts to actually take back some of the money creation. And that's a very substantial risk. Um, the other thing is that as the economy picks up, as it has been, um, that this extra growth could also lead to uh, inflationary pressures. And um, it's, it's another reason to, to beware. Um, in 
in, again, your institutional portfolio or your retail portfolio, inflation risk is something that absolutely has to be managed and the time to do it is now. Recently, Ben Bernanke said that the Fed had failed in the employment mandate. Yes, um, well, I, I guess that's technically true. I guess if you read my blog uh, or seen um, some of my uh, you know, YouTube videos, this is something I've got a strong opinion on, that it doesn't make sense, the mandate that the Fed's got. So the ECB doesn't have the same mandate as the Fed. The ECB's mandate is basically price stability, whereas the Fed's mandate is both price stability and full employment. And there are a limited number of things that the Fed can actually do on the employment front. So it is true that our unemployment rate is still unacceptably high by recent standards. Uh, we have seen some improvement. And I think that the sentiment in the market right now is to seize upon all of the good news, no matter how small it is. So for example, we've had three consecutive months of um, non-farm perils growth that exceeded 200,000 jobs. And that is good. Actually, we've got a long string of uh, positive numbers from non-farm perils. And we've seen the unemployment rate go down to the low uh, 8%. That, that's good also. But you need to put it in perspective. Okay, the first thing that you need to realize is that simply to handle the people that are coming into the workforce, the people graduating from college or high school that decide um, to take a job, just to handle that, we need to create on net, there are also people that leave, but on net, we need to create at the low end, at the low end, 75,000 jobs uh, a month. And then at the higher end, 150,000. So taking the people that come into the labor force into account, the job growth that we've seen is trivial. It's not enough to get us back to where we were for many, many years. Okay, that's number one point. Uh, number two point is this low 8% unemployment rate is highly misleading. Basically, this is what's happened. Um, the recession officially started in December 2007. As people became unemployed and they looked for jobs, looked for jobs, looked for jobs, a lot of them abandoned looking. They dropped out of the labor force. And we see this directly in the participation rate. So if you look at it, it's like a straight line heading down from uh, December uh, 2007. So, so essentially, this low 8% unemployment is not counting, that percentage doesn't count the people that have kind of dropped out. So the total labor force that is supposedly um, the relevant labor force doesn't include the people that dropped out. So a simple exercise to say, well, what if we had the same participation rate today that we had in December um, 2007? Well, it's a totally different story. It's 11% unemployment. So, so we've not seen any substantial progress on the employment side. The other thing to realize, and uh, this is definitely uh, part of the chairman's uh, testimony, um, that as the economy picks up, essentially what's going to happen is that some of these people that abandon the labor force are going to re-enter. Remember I said just by natural aging, you've got 75,000 to 150,000? Well, as those people start coming in, we're going to need to create a lot more than 200,000 jobs a month to get the unemployment rate. So these people coming back into the labor force, which is a good thing, don't get me wrong here, it just raises the hurdle. So I think that, um, I think too much attention is paid to kind of the string of positives that we've seen in terms of non-farm payroll growth, and too little attention is paid to the big picture that we've had 
a, basically a structural problem. We had a structural change that we had overinvested in particular in one particular sector of, uh, of our economy. That sector is nothing like it used to be, the housing sector. Uh, it is a third of what it used to be. And that caused a disruption, or it's part of, of the problem, that uh, it's going to take an extremely long time uh, to recover from that. And people that are uh, naively projecting that rate, you know, to head back down to 5% in the next couple of years, uh, don't take into consideration basic things like people coming back into the workforce that uh, had abandoned looking for a job. So what can we do about this problem of employment and new people entering the workforce? Well, there's nothing that you can do about kind of the natural uh, demographics of people aging. Um, basically, there are things that you could do, but you need to understand kind of the short-term and the long-term consequences. So I think that um, during this... Uh, this economic episode, you know, following the financial crisis, that kind of learned some stuff about economics, kind of the hard way, that it is possible that the government could go borrow a lot more money and provide some employment relief. They could literally create jobs. Um, I think that what we've learned with with stimulus uh, spending is that we need to consider not just the short term but the long term in two respects. Uh, number one respect, is this the best thing for the, uh, the new employees of a government sponsored uh, operation? Does it set them up for better opportunities going forward? And it's not clear and, and I think it's not it's not black and white either, because there could be some good opportunities, but uh, some that are not that uh, productive. The other um, is we borrow today to do that. We need to pay it back. And I think that's another one of the major risks we're going to talk about in the, in the webinar, that it's, it's easy to spend today, but it is an obligation that has to be paid back. And we've seen what's happened. Uh, to these other countries where they get into a situation where they don't have the ability to do any smoothing of kind of the fiscal situation in their country um, because they are basically held hostage to the interest that they have to pay on their debt. So right now the U.S. is, is actually the amount of debt has, has hugely increased, I think it's five trillion dollars in, in the last um, four years, but the servicing cost of that debt hasn't increased. And why? Well, because the interest rates are very low. What happens if those interest rates go up? And we've seen, it's not just speculation, we've seen what, what has happened in Greece, we've seen the pressures in, 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 um, in Italy where basically you've got a government that is a technocratic government. So it, it impinges on your democracy. So the interest servicing cost goes up either because of risk or because of inflation, then all of a sudden your flexibility disappears. So I guess I would prefer, and uh, looking at this as, as an economist um, and trying to remove myself as much as possible from the politics of the situation, that um, I think that one of the big mistakes that was made, and this is not a Democratic mistake or a Republican mistake, it was just bas basically almost everybody was saying the same thing, and that was that the financial crisis, well, it was just a, a cyclical phenomena. And in a cycle, you can kind of make the case uh, for smoothing out the downside. So the government's kind of providing insurance to make it less painful because you know that uh, things will improve quite sharply as they have in other recessions. The problem is that it wasn't cyclical, it was structural. And when you go and, and 
spend aggressively um, thinking that it's a cyclical thing. So if it's cyclical, maybe you only need somebody to have a job for a year, and then they'll go back into the labor force because the economy's improving. That's not our situation. So this is a multiple, you know, five year at least at the best possible scenario. And you can see this throughout all of the economic projections, uh, even by kind of nonpartisan, um, uh, you know, agencies and things like that, that people expected the recovery to be a lot sharper because they thought it was cyclical. It's structural. So in that case, you need to be very careful. What we need right now is increased growth. And that growth is most likely fostered uh, from the private sector. And I'm not saying to abandon social programs or anything like that, but I'm just saying whatever we can do to uh, manage that growth, to provide an atmosphere, to get back to the sort of growth that we've seen after other recessions, right now we're at trend. The growth last year, 1.9% is below trend. We need something in the four or five percent range. You know, other countries are growing um, in that range. Uh, you know, not in in North America, but it is possible to do that. We've done that before. We need the sort of uh, environment for that to happen, and just you know, to basically uh, manipulate GDP. And what do I mean by that? Uh, just to have you can increase government spending, that's a component of GDP. And it increases your GDP in the short term. That's not what you want. What we want is the sort of growth that leads to um, jobs that are for the long term and investments that deliver growth for our economy. Not 1.9%, because that's, that's not gonna do us any good in terms of the employment side. So the answer to your question is not an easy question to answer, but I'm more of the opinion uh, not to go back and do another round of uh, stimulus. I think the verdict is pretty well out on, on that the first time, uh, but to try to create the atmosphere whereby um, we allow uh, for the maximum possible growth opportunities. And the U.S. in particular has got plenty of sectors that have growth opportunities. And it's unfortunate that a lot of them are very hesitant to hire new employees, to invest in, in new capital uh, projects because of all the uncertainty that's swirling around a situation where um, the U.S. is effectively drifting into um, a kind of a sovereign debt situation that could substantially complicate the growth prospects for our economy in the future. So if you're a corporation, you want to sit back and, and basically reflect on that and say, well, maybe, maybe I should wait. And that's effectively what's been happening. Wait, which means low employment growth and low GDP growth. So you spoke about unemployment in the U.S. So what are those prospects in the European Union for unemployment? Just absolutely abysmal. Uh, Europe is effectively in recession. Um, and you've seen countries like Spain, and I want to talk about Spain a little bit, where the unemployment rate, it isn't below 8% like US, it's 20%. Can you imagine if we had 20% unemployment in the US, what a situation it would be? Um, and then even more critically, the youth unemployment rate in Spain is 50%. So you are basically setting up a huge long-term, not just economic problem, but a social problem. The, it just, again, screams of risk. So um, it, it's actually, um, I saw some really interesting analysis uh, uh, today, actually, that did a very um, ingenious split of the world. Um, not just developed in emerging markets, but they also split each category by whether the currency was free floating or linked. So then looked at the growth of, let's say, developed markets that are free floating 
or length. So that would be kind of like the US as free floating and Europe as length. Um, and then looked at emerging markets, again, um, by uh, free float, which most of them are, or linked, like China. And extremely interesting, because in all the cases, the, the link prospects were a lot worse. You don't have the flexibility. So Spain does not have the flexibility to get out of their problems with a devaluation. Devaluation would make their products more competitive. We've seen this is the way that it works in, in you know, historically. Uh, you get into trouble with debt, um, you devalue, which means that the holders of the debt take a hit. Um, your exports become more competitive, your labor becomes more competitive, uh, and you're able to kind of dig out of a crisis. That's not available for Spain. It's not available for Greece, Portugal, or Ireland, so it is a real problem uh, for, for these countries. So I think that um, because they don't have that lever and you know, because they can't devalue, they have to do things like austerity or bailouts. So in doing that, um, you're going to take a hit when it comes to unemployment. So you see the difference? So if you devalue, you take, everybody takes um, uh, the devaluation hit in terms of their wealth. It's like a tax, right? Everything is hit. But then, um, all of a sudden, employment prospects get a lot better because labor is cheaper, people want to locate their plants in your country, and, and you kind of move on from there. It's just not an option right now. So, so I think that this system, people are realizing, um, they're, they're hoping, uh, and it's really, all it is is hope, that uh, essentially kicking the can down the road one more time, which is what they've done, um, with this bailout of, of, of Greece, um, that it will buy enough time so that there's growth, and then with the growth, the financial institutions can become stronger, and eventually something will positively happen to employment. It's not clear to me at all. I said Spain with the 50% youth unemployment rate. Spain is really um, interesting in this. It is different than the other countries because going into the financial crisis, the government debt to GDP wasn't that high. It was essentially mainly the private sector. So there was, think of it as a real estate bubble. And just like what happened in the US where people were uh, financing, you know, overvalued real estate. Uh, and, and the banks in Spain, they're not even close to, to being solvent, uh, in my opinion. And it, it's, it's all uh, smoke and mirrors when they say that they need, you know, X billion to get to 9% um, core one, um, you know, tier capital. It, they are not even close. The question is, how much do they need? And is it feasible for the ESM at the EFSF, is there enough money there to bail out Spain? That, that's the real issue. And we know already the ECB has bought 50 billion of, uh, euros of, um, of Spanish sovereign debt. And we know from the LTRO, which is effectively a trillion dollar um, monetary injection, the Spanish banks took about 100 uh, billion of that, and they bought uh, basically with well, both half they used to buy their own sovereign. Okay, so these banks are already insolvent. They're borrowing money from the ECB, and then they're buying risky Spanish government debt. Now, is that what you want them to do? I, I, I guess so. So the ECB alone, just just the ECB, is already on the hook for at minimum 100 billion euros. And then you need to figure out all of the debts that are due. Now, I said that the central government uh, debt wasn't that bad to GDP. Um, but, you know, it's changing because their deficits are, are massive. And they it basically ignored the directive from the ECB um, and the Eurozone as to what the target was going to be and, and greatly exceeded it. Um, so they are racking up debt. And it's also the local governments. So the local governments, about a fifth of the debt is local government debt. So they're in an extreme leverage situation, 
and they are going to need money, they're the next one on the radar screen. So the way that this is going to work, um, Portugal is small, Ireland, Ireland's going to get a better deal because Greece got a deal. And Ireland is, is different because they actually have good growth opportunities. They've got good infrastructure, and I think, um, a, I think they're in a better position for actual real economic growth than the other countries. Um, but the real issue will be, um, that will come up first is, uh, and the chancellor um, in Germany has already floated the idea of additional bailout money because they know, they've done the calculations. What they say in public is designed to increase confidence. And we, you know, how many times did they say, well, we're not going to let Greece default? And they've defaulted, right? So it's going to be the same thing. Oh, we're never going to let Spain default. So you know what they say is not the real situation. And when you get hints like um, the Germans are willing to increase the firewall, that's pretty serious because they've done the calculations. You know, they're extremely diligent on this and in terms of risk management, they're very good and they know exactly what's due and they know the balance sheets, they're there, like they are in Spain. Um, going through um, you know, the balance sheets of these financial institutions, they know what's there and they know what it's worth and they know that these banks basically are faced with a situation where they will go under unless they are somehow recapitalized, either via a bailout or a nationalization. Um, it is a situation that is, you know, absolutely needs attention. So they will be the next one. That's where the focus is going to be, and uh, and basically, it, you know, the big one, of course, is Italy. That if Italy goes then the whole Eurozone is gone. And I think they realize that. So the way that they have to be so careful in managing Spain, because if it is contagious to Italy, and we've seen hints of this in the past, then that's it. Italy's too big. There's no way um, that they can go through and, and, and bail out Spain and Italy. It's just not worth it for the Germans. They just can say, forget it. You know, I, I, we know it's bad um, to, to drop the Euro. Um, but at some point, if it's going to cost such a huge part of your economy to bail out another country, it's better to take the hit in your own economy in the short term, which would mean a revaluation, um, a very substantial revaluation, with either a group of kind of northern um, European countries in, in a new euro, or just go back to the free float. The free float, you know, um, worked well, actually. And that, Frankly, it's easier to have a floating currency today with all of the electronic trading. You see, how many ads do you see for some Forex service? And it's, it's, on your, on, it's on your iPhone. You've got an app for it. So you've got a computer. So to actually deal in individual currencies is not as big of a deal as it was when they were planning uh, a single currency. And, and we all know that um, the problem with uh, the Eurozone is that you have no fiscal discipline. And the sort of things that they've offered in, in terms of uh, unifying principles and things like that, it's old news, I'm afraid. It is old news. It wasn't enforced in the past, and I doubt it'll be enforced in the future, which does not bode well. And of course, that's another one of the major risks that we'll talk about in the webinar. Well, Professor Harvey, thank you so much for speaking with me today. We look forward to hearing your additional information about the Eurozone and the rest of the world at your upcoming webinar. Thanks, Christina.